Coming up next on Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. You're just a house remodeled away from being happy. You're just a better sex life away from being happy. You're just that first child away from being happy. And God says, when we buy into that, we become spiritual adulteresses. Hi, my name is Chip Ingram, and welcome to Living on the Edge. We're going to start something brand new today. It's called Five Lies That Ruin Relationships. You know, we all have something in common. When our relationships aren't working, most of us are miserable. And you know, we all buy lies. We all have struggles, whether they're in our marriage, or at work, with our kids, you know, with a roommate if you're single. This series is about the lies that we buy, the misbeliefs that we have down deep in our mind and often in our heart that destroy our relationships. Now, this series is written by a very interesting author. It's written by James. It's the first book of the New Testament, and if you want to follow along, you can open your Bible to chapter 4 and about half of chapter 5. And in it, we're going to learn the very things that you believe that are causing conflict in your relationships. If you want great relationships, or if you're struggling in the relationships that you have, for the next 10 weeks, you need to tune in. I am so excited about our time together. Now, you ready? In this first session, we're going to talk about why you fight and why I fight with the very people that we love. Let's join the teaching. I want you to allow your mind to go to a park. It's a beautiful sunny day in your mind's eye. Big fluffy white clouds, the sky's very blue. It's a beautiful park with a lot of greenery. And as the camera of your mind's eye zooms in, there's a bench. And in the background, there's children running and playing and doing what children do, but it's kind of white noise. And as you zoom in, you see there's a little girl who's about maybe eight or nine years old. She has little pigtails. She's really cute. She's got a few freckles across her nose. And you see a man sitting on the bench that's obviously her father, and he looks very uncomfortable. As you watch from a distance, he kind of moves here, moves there, and you can tell even from a distance it's just chit-chat, and he has his keys, and he keeps flipping his keys from one direction to the other because that's what dads do when they have to say something very hard to a very young child, and they don't know exactly how to say it or exactly what to say. As he prepares this speech that he's rehearsed in his mind over and over and over, and this is the moment of truth. He picked her up from their home that's about a mile away. He thought the park would be kind of the best place to break the news. And as he fidgets and tries to figure out as a grown man how to break the news to this little eight or nine-year-old who is daddy's girl, the silence is broken by this little innocent comment. And she looks up at him, and she says, Daddy? He goes, yeah, hon. He said, are you going to come home soon? Are you going to come back to live with me and Mommy? I really miss you. And he realizes that all the rehearsing of his speech in his mind is didn't prepare him for this, and everything in him wants to start crying, but he holds back the tears. He says, well, honey, um, that's why we came to the park today. I need to tell you something. See, Daddy's not going to be coming home. And what I want you to know, sweetheart, it's not you. I love you. I want to be with you. I, I wish so much that I could be with you, but it's me and your mommy. We just can't get along. We've tried. We've really tried, sweetheart. And you've heard us late at night, and we yell at each other, and we scream at each other. And we've tried everything, but we fight, fight, fight. And so we're going to get what big people call a divorce. And I'll still see you, honey. Um, I'm going I'm to make sure that I get to come by and, you know, be here on birthdays. And we even have it worked out where you get to spend a couple months with me in the summertime. But no, honey, I, I'm, I can't come home. And she gives him that look that only an eight-year-old can give that says... I don't understand this. 
you love mommy and you love me and I love you and I love mommy. How could two people that love each other this much not be able to work out whatever you need to work out? And uh, he says to her, I know you can't understand, but maybe someday you will. And I just want you to know, and now those little pigtails are kind of down on her shoulder. And now the tears, she's not even crying. They're just flowing and streaming down her face. And until she is 80 years old, that picture in that park will be etched in her memory forever and ever and ever. And it will impact, regardless of what mommy or dad says, how she views herself. And it will impact how she relates to the opposite sex. And it will impact how she views God. And it will change everything about her life to some degree. And she didn't understand it when she was eight. She won't fully understand it when she's 18. And she may never fully understand it till she's 80. Why do we fight with those that we love? Why is it that two people that honestly, sincerely, deeply love one another can get at levels of conflict that they have to give up or choose to give up? And as I tell that story, for some of you, we have all kind of different ages. You were that little boy, you were that little girl. And for you, maybe it wasn't you were eight, you could have been five, or maybe you were 12 or 13. And you remember being on the receiving end of one of your parents, your mom or your dad, telling you that it's just not going to work. And maybe it happened in the bedroom, or maybe it happened in the mall, or maybe it happened in a park. But it's etched in your mind. And it's shaped a lot of you. And for others, it's uh, you weren't the little boy or little girl. You remember when you were the mom or you were the dad giving this speech to one of your kids. And it seems like a long time ago, and because your mind is made by God and you have an amazing, amazing ability to repress, sometimes you can push it way down deep, and you know maybe that was then, and you're in a second marriage now, and things are better, but as I told that story, some things got really deeply uncomfortable inside of you that you haven't thought about in a while. And it keeps bringing back the question. And I'm talking about Christians. Why do we fight with those that we love? Spouses fight against spouses. Why is it in some of our homes our children fight against each other? Why is it when kids get to be teenagers that they tend to fight against their parents? Why is it when you get to be an adult and you have grown parents that sometimes you fight with your grown parents? Why is it that people can seem to get along and then someone dies and families that look intact when they start talking about where the money's going to go and who gets the estate, some of the most ugly things can ever come out of believers' mouths? Why is it that people in the same churches that love the same God that have paid by the blood of Christ can just rip churches apart? When someone thinks someone said something about them or someone's doing something with the building or one of the buses or we disagree about what should happen to a staff member. Why is it that their families, maybe some in this room who live within three to five miles of one another and you don't even speak. You don't even speak to one another. Why do we fight with those that we love? Because the fact is that we do. And what the Holy Spirit is going to say through Jesus' brother, who wrote the very first book of the New Testament, James, he's going to explain to us not only the cause of fighting among us as God's children, he's going to talk about the consequences of what happens when we fight with one another. And then here's the good news. He's going to give us the cure. He's going to give us very direct, clear instruction about how we can stop the conflict, about how we, we can stop it and those things don't have to go on and restoration can occur. Open your Bibles, if you're not already there, to James chapter 4, and let's dig in together. And you'll notice what James begins. He raises the very issue. 
He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Rhetorical question. And by the way, it's in the tense of the verb that says these things are presently occurring in this church. I mean, this is written to a church. And he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? In other words, it's happening right now. And then he's going to answer the question, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Will you circle the word pleasures and then circle the word war? Literally, he says, isn't it your passions that wage war in your members or literally among you? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And then someone's thinking to themselves, no, wait a second, James, you know what? I, I pray. And he says, yeah, you're right. There is a second category. There's some of you that ask, but you do it with the wrong motives. And you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. Why? So that you can spend it on yourself. The summary of that is the root cause of interpersonal conflicts according to James, is our consuming passion for self-gratification. Jot those two words in, will you? Self-gratification. He says, th this word, what is the cause of wars? It, it means a protracted, the word for wars here, is a protracted state of hostility. Why is it in the church there's, there's literal wars going on among the members? What causes the fightings? These are pictures of little outbursts of anger that break out. And it's in the plural here. It's happening within and among them. He says, is it not your, your pleasure or your passions? And I had you circle that because we get our word hedonism from it. The Greek word is hedone. Hedonism is one who lives for pleasure, the passion for lust to fulfill one's desires, the cravings of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's an addictive self-love. He says the source of your quarrels is your own selfish gratification. It's the me first mindset. You fight because you want this and someone else wants this. It's your lust, it's your passions. He says you envy or literally you covet. You want what someone else has and then you don't get it so you commit murder. Boy, isn't that strong? Those are strong words for a church, isn't it? And whether that literally was happening in this context or whether he's speaking of murdering people, as Jesus said, if you say, raka to your brother, if you have hatred in your heart toward him, you're committing murder. But, but, but whether it's a, a metaphorical murdering with your tongue that is slander, or, or murdering your heart out of hatred, or whether it got to be literal, I've seen it become literal. I mean, how many of us heard of a story in a local church where someone gets bent out of shape in a church conflict, right? And they come in on a Sunday morning, I've heard of this at least four or five times in the last 10 years. They come in on a Sunday morning with a gun and either shoot the preacher or shoot one of the elders or leaders or deacons or whatever they call them in the special churches. And, you know, this is a church, and I bet if you do the research, everybody in the room is born again. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? But we don't have to imagine it. This is reality. And he says the cause is that you want You've got this pulsating desire. I have this pulsating desire, even as a believer, to satisfy or gratify my own way. We covet. And this, this is a strong word. Or it's the idea of not the wholesome kind of God-given pleasure, but the sinful, self-indulgent pleasure, the hot desire to possess something for your own ego and self-gratification. And you can't obtain it. In other words, you get blocked, and so you wage war. And then you don't have things. And he says, you know why? Because you're trying to get it from other places instead of from God. And some of you, you know, you try to get it from God, but you do it with the wrong motives. And so he says the source of interpersonal conflict is self-gratification. And if you wanted to summarize it, I've put some notes down. Our problem, just write two words, selfish pride. That's our problem. It's the inner passion within each of us that craves our own way. And behind that craving is the belief that pleasure and fun and sensual fulfillment must be achieved at all costs. The symptoms are conflict. Conflict. And the conflict is evidenced in broken relationships. We want something, our goals are blocked, our, our, our desires are frustrated, and so it leads to violence. 
competing desires. It's, it's the classic picture of one cookie and two two-year-olds. And what James says is, is that one cookie and two two two-year-olds mentality, and it might be a position in the church, it might be about money, it might be about sex, it might be about a number of different things, but that same passionate desire to possess and get your way and me wanting to get my way is at the core of interpersonal conflict. Third, he says, what's the strategy? Our strategies are twofold. First, we attempt to fulfill our desires apart from God. We want something badly. Maybe we want something in our marriage. Maybe we want it from our boss. Maybe we want it in the church. Maybe we want it from one of our kids. Maybe we want something badly as a single person. And he says, the wrong strategy is you try and get it apart from God. Notice the line that he said. He said, you don't have because you don't ask. There's some ways through either manipulation or intimidation or image management, that we try and get what we want instead of going to God and say, God, this is my heart's desire. The second way, in terms of strategy, is not just attempts to fulfill desires apart from God, but we try to use God to fulfill our selfish desires. We we try to make God our self-help genie. God, I'm praying that you will give this to me. And the goal isn't the glory of God. The goal isn't the agenda of God. And by the way, I've never seen this more popular than it is in our day. And I mean, I'll tell you what, it sells. Jesus can make you happy. Jesus can help you lose weight. Jesus can make you rich. Jesus can make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Jesus can eliminate all your problems. You know what? God is not the center or the core or the infinite one who's holy in the universe. You are the center of the universe, and he's your errand boy. And we'll give you a little formula And tell you what you do, you get him to run your errands for you. And I mean, it is being preached and it is being taught and it's being gobbled up because I tell you what, there's something in all of us, right? And maybe Jesus is that ticket. I'll be happy. You know, Jesus is the ticket to, I'm gonna, if I love him and follow this formula, I'll have this big house on the hill and I'll have another house over here and I'll drive this kind of car and I'll have this kind of watch and these kind of clothes and uh, beautiful women are gonna jump in my car or handsome hunks are gonna serve me butter that we can't believe it's butter. And I mean, (laughs) Jesus is my ticket to self-fulfillment. And it's a perversion of the gospel. And it's a perversion of the truth. And, and it's not new. I mean, this is the first book written in the New Testament. And what he's saying here is your wrong strategies are, one, you try and get your stuff apart from God, or you try and actually use God. You're asking God to do things, but it's not for him. It's with perverted wrong motives. And then finally, the results are our passions and our drives and the blocks of people's goals result in frustration within and fights without. He's saying to this local church, let's remember, this is a local church. You have fights without and you have frustration within because the root cause of interpersonal conflict in marriage, with children, in the church, at work, he says at the core is self-gratification or literally hedonism. This commitment that I gotta have my way. I need to fulfill my sensual lusts. And... um, In our honest moments, we all have to admit this is true of all of us. I mean, we can make it very sophisticated and we can put some verses around it and we can act a little more pious, but you have conflict in your home, I have conflict in my home. If you're married, you have some conflict in your marriage, I have some conflict in my marriage. And for years and years, not really years and years, but as I tell the story, making it bigger and bigger to make it better and better, uh, for years and years, I said the whole key to our marriage is, is, is if Teresa just wasn't so selfish. <laughs> I mean, she's just so lovely and pretty and nice and kind and sweet, and that's what everyone thinks. But down behind that beautiful blonde hair and sweet countenance and wonderful mother and now grandmother, there is a very strong woman who wants her way. <laughs> and in private moments with... Um, probably a few ladies of trusted confidence that she really prays with, there's probably been at least a moment or two 
that despite her husband's role and job of teaching God's word and, you know, working hard at being a good dad, some of the conflict, I think she would say, you know, the problem is Chip is down behind all that is this really selfish guy that wants his way. And when I want my way and she wants her way, guess what that's called? Conflict. Now, as you mature in Christ, you handle it in a lot better ways, right? But, hey, people, let's not act like this passage is for someone else. All right? <laughs> And a lot of times what happens is we hit those conflicts and the reason you don't argue about them is they produce such conflict you don't even talk about them anymore. And I watch marriages that are on parallel tracks with very little intimacy or I watch families on parallel tracks where, oh yeah, we don't argue with our kids. That's because we've decided anything that causes conflict we're not going to talk about. So the kids are gradually going off their way and you're going off their way. And then when they land over here in the ditch because you didn't want the conflict, you know, you pull out your Bible in Proverbs 22, train a child up in the way he should go and he won't depart. God, I don't get this. He departed. Oh, really? Because at the heart of every little boy, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, right? And so you have to confront issues. You have to realize, I have to realize, I've got to confront issues in me and you and you and in all of our relationships that we are people of the flesh despite this wonderful thing that God has given us, this new birth where the Spirit of God lives in us and the Spirit has sealed us and He's given us gifts and we have power. But we live in a fallen world and there's a tempter out there and we will do things and we will struggle in areas that will cause interpersonal conflict and at the heart of it is, not the devil made me do it, What's James 1 say? You sin when you're carried away by your own lusts. Well, let's get on the uh, diagnostic side, and then we'll quickly move to the solution side. James is going to say, okay, that's the cause of quarrels. Now he's going to give us God's diagnosis. Our constant quarrels reveal three different things. He's going to say there's some consequences, but these quarrels are going to reveal something, and they're going to reveal something all the way over here. He's going to say that you have a belief system. And in your belief system, because when you have this con frustration within, conflict without, you have a belief system that you have believed a lie. And he's going to tell us what that lie is in just a minute. And at the core of that lie is that we have believed the lie of hedonism, and I'll address it in a second. Then he'll say that after believing the lie, once you believe a lie, there's a series of behaviors that have you beginning to move farther and farther and farther away from God and closer to the world and the world system. He'll call it the cosmos. The world system is um, primetime TV, walking out the grocery stand, people, Cosmo, Ellie, Forbes. There's a world system that says... The way to significance, fulfillment, and satisfaction is how you look, what you make, who you know, how many people report to you, what you own, and, and it's when you can have the pleasures of the world, then you're a somebody. You're just a house remodeled away from being happy. You're just a better sex life away from being happy. You're just that first child away from being happy. You're just getting married. You're single now, but man, if I was married, then you'll be happy. You're just something out there, and the world paints every evening in prime time and now on 150 cable channels and magazines and romance novels and billboards and songs, and they're all telling you a web that the world is saying, this is what will deliver real happiness and fulfillment. And God says, when we buy into that, we become spiritual adulteresses. We leave our first love, and we embrace and fall in love with the world, and we lose our relationship and our heart for God. He says, we believe a lie, we betray a trust, and then it gets actually scary. He says, we actually can come to the point where even though we are God's people, we become enemies. God will literally, in this passage, you'll see in the next few verses, God will literally put on battle array when his children are being wooed away from him 
and beginning to live like the world, he will put on battle array and go to war against us. It will be out of a heart of love and he will do what I call the velvet vice. It'll be a vice and they'll have velvet on the outside of it and he will bring about a velvet vice of pressure in your life to get you to change your mind about what really satisfies and to return to him. It's called the Hebrews 12 experience. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I think I'm like a lot of people where I try to avoid conflict, but since I'm now getting older, I've discovered that the best way to resolve it is to approach it calmly, but the most important thing is to try to resolve it. Sometimes just the effort to communicate gets you over the hurdle. Kind of shy away from conflict. Um, I like to dive in, just get it out in the open. I'm ready to talk about it and get it on the table and deal with it, whereas I have to learn that other people may not be in that same position or predicament where they're ready to just discuss it at that moment. I think my biggest problem is that I dive into it and I kind of make the make things bigger than they should be, make the argument larger and add to it when maybe I should shy away a little bit more. If it's too big of a conflict and I don't feel like dealing with it, then just shy away and, you know, let it, you know, blow, see if it blows over. As we wrap up today's program, I hope you'll take advantage of uh, that opportunity. Get this on CD and listen to it. Uh, these are heavy things and you need to hear God speak to you over and over. But here's what I know. You need to act on the truth that you've heard today. And my tendency when there's conflict in a relationship, and whether it's with my wife or with one of my kids or a coworker or, you know, someone down at the coffee shop, someone in the home association, you know, we all have conflict. My tendency is to get focused on their side of it, their blame, what they did wrong. What I learned from God's word today and what you heard God say is, you know, at the heart of it, I've got issues. You've got issues. So here's your assignment. I want you to get out a sheet of paper. You can use a spiral notebook. And I want you to put a line down the center of that paper. And on the left side, put that person's name. It might be your mate, might be your boss. And just list, bullet point, the four or five things that they've really done to mess up this relationship. And then on the right side, I want you to put your name. And then I want you to write the three or four or five things that you've done. And then I want you to take that right side and say, God, will you please forgive me? And then every day this week, only for seven days, and I'll see you back next week because we're going to get on the solution side. But every day this week, I want you to pray for that person. Pray that God will bless them. Pray that God will help them. You take that step and you watch God work.